Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here on a Saturday afternoon. I think as podcasters, we all know what a pleasure and a privilege it is to get someone's attention. I know that there's a million other things you could do, like listen to a podcast, watch a movie, go for a walk. And that's what we're constantly dealing with, uh, trying to get people to tune in and stay tuned. So thank you for being here. Um, Cedric Tuss, maybe we can this is just the part part of the Dead Writers podcasting team that are here today. We are missing two uh, or three notable members who weren't here because of traveling. Um, Sue Tran, who is our public radio liaison, we'll get into that later. Brock Clark, who's our co-host and writer, and our editorial intern, Ella Jones. But um, I'm Lisa Bartfi, and everyone will get through um, introducing themselves a little more later on. First, we thought we would introduce the project. So um, my computer has been very unhappy with me because I've attended too many of these panels and it's completely overheating. So I'm going to try doing this mix of things. We'll see how it goes. But basically, we're going to introduce the podcast first, then we're going to um, Tess is going to talk about the pre-production part of how we um, collaborated and shared labor uh, after her. I'll step in and talk a little bit about the production phase and Cedric will finish it off with a bang uh, talking about post-production and uh, collaborating between private professionals, independent freelancers, and um, a podcast product like this in academia. And you'll see we'll all kind of carry uh, different roles and different relationships to the humanities and to academia. But let's see if this works. Um, zoop. And I'm going to just get it all set up and then I'll share my screen in just a moment. Yep, oh, not you, my friend. Okay. Let's see here. And all right, so so what we have here uh, is um, a little pitch deck that we created uh, for the podcast to share with potential sponsors and partners. And I'm just going to show you what this looks like because I think it will give you a better sense of what we've done so far, which is we have presented a um, um, six. Oh, interesting. Okay. It's just, oh, there we go. Um, it's a six part limited episode series. Um, it's a narrative show about right, American authors and their homes. And Tess and her co-host Rock are taking us along to different writers' homes in Maine. Oh, this Sunday, get in the car, there we go. turn on Maine Public Radio, and join us for a road trip through Maine. We'll go to the homes of some of America's most famous authors. Hawthorne apparently had a sky parlor um, in, in his, one of his it houses, is which seems perfect. That sounds that pornographic. Share, do <laughs> this is Dead Writers, the show yet. about great American authors and where they lived. Let's go. Um, and so that was just like a little part of our promo that you heard, along with some of that um, sponsorship material that we had. Um, so what we did was that we created this narrative series that had a lot of texture. We used um, interviews in studio. We had some unscripted chat and banter between our two hosts. Um, did other folks hear any segment? I didn't. <laughs> I cannot answer that for you. Yeah, you heard? Okay. Some folks heard. Uh, okay, great. I'm sorry about that, my friend. Well, well. Get, get you a link so you can listen to the whole podcast later on. Um, so uh, we had this multifaceted kind of storytelling technique where we relied on a lot of reporting in the field. Tess and Brock went to these literary homes and chatted with the folks. And uh, we had a lot of sounds from those walks and tried to really make it 
uh, feel as if you're there with them. Uh, we also had some archival material, some beautiful sound design and original music by Cedric. And um, as I mentioned, some of the scripted part along with like unscripted uh, parts. So it was a fairly complex way of telling a story. And it was also a fairly intricate way that it came together, which Tess will tell us more about later. But this um, collaboration that we had, which was between Bowdoin College and the two um, faculty members that are hosts and creators of this podcast, a couple of independent like myself and Cedric, and then ultimately we um, forged a relationship with Maine Public Radio, an NPR affiliate in our state who distributed it, was a really a first for me. It was the first time that I was in this beautiful collaboration between the public and the private college and the independent, and it was a really exciting collaboration but not without its difficulties and that's part of what we're here to do today is as um tess cedric myself we're gearing up for a season two we're trying to kind of wrap our brains around what that will look like we thought that this panel would be a fantastic opportunity for us to think through how did we distribute the labor, how did it actually work out, what could we do differently and better, and also how could we share some of the great insights that we got during this process, because it was a steep learning curve for me. I can't speak for anyone else, but it certainly was for me, uh, who has previously worked more exclusively in one of these or the other, either public radio or private podcasting. Um, so we just wanted to share some of that knowledge with you. And the way it's going to go is, as I mentioned, we're going to walk you through what the labor sharing and collaborative practices were like at every step of the production process. And we're going to do it chronologically from beginning to end with the pre-production ideation, the production, and then the post-production. So. Um, I'm going to take you along for that ride and I'm going to hand it over to Tess. And in the meantime, I'm going to put a link to our podcast in the chat so that you can check it out afterwards. Thanks, Lisa. Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep, um, okay, good. Um, so Lisa said um, she didn't want to speak for everyone else, but she actually could speak for for me because as it was with Lisa, this was a steep learning curve for me too. And I just came from the session um, about academic podcasting. Um, I can't remember exactly what it was called, but that one was with all academics. And it was interesting for me to observe the differences between the philosophy or the their ideas around an acad a strictly speaking academic podcast and this one, which is which is one that uh, kind of uh, surprisingly brought together the public, the private and the independent. And frankly, I don't think it ever would have been made without this collaboration uh, when it was just me and Brock working on it um, by ourselves at Bowdoin, fumbling along, uh, we got nowhere. It was only after Lisa um, entered the picture, um, she moved to Brunswick fortuitously for us, um, and I was able to connect with her that we were able to actually imagine this thing happening. And uh, it was her practical knowledge of podcasts that made that possible. Um, and then another kind of fluke was uh, me appearing as a as a literary expert or an academic on one of Maine Public's um, programs, Maine Calling, that allowed me to develop a connection with Maine Public that I was only able really to foster uh, with Lisa's expertise. So I, I also think Lisa wouldn't have decided to make this kind of podcast if I guess I didn't have my expertise um in order to 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 capitalize on it and i'm still still sort of struggling although the, the collaboration to me was fantastic it's um pe peculiarity is something that um I, I wonder if we haven't been able to find or, or grow an audience because we're such an odd mix of people um and working with different institutions so we're not 
we're not all in on the kind of um, popular mainstream podcasts. And then we're not really an academic podcast either. So this is something that kind of worries me as we move into to season two. How are we going to capitalize on this collaboration and not um, force ourselves into a kind of kind of really niche box that makes it difficult to grow our audience. So that's something that I've been worrying about. One thing, again, another difference with the academic podcast is that I was really told and coached by Lisa uh, to avoid um, academic speak. And so it was, you know, Brock, this comes a little bit more naturally to him as my co-host because he's a creative writer. And um, for some reason, I don't think he's as steeped in the jargon of academia as I am, um, because he writes for a general audience, whereas I write um, in academic journals and um, monographs and in that world of academia a little bit more. So I really had to, my learning curve I feel might have been the steepest because I had to, um, but, I, but maybe not, maybe other people had to learn more, um, but I, I had to really kind of change the way I spoke and thought about the material um, in order to communicate it most effectively. And on this, I really had to rely on Lisa's coaching of me. And this was really new because actually I'm, I'm, I'm old. And, uh, you know, sometimes you can't really teach an old dog new tricks around, um, you know, I feel like I'm an expert in my field and uh, people, I should be telling others what to do because that's basically how I, I guess I've been teaching for over um, a quarter of a century. Um, so I, it was, I had to really kind of let go of a lot of my um, um, feelings of being an expert, um, being an authority in my field and allow myself to be retrained um, in order to uh, be a part of this medium, which I very much want to, but I had to let go of the, my, my previous ways of communicating in the classroom and in academic um, journals and, and writing. And so that was a really new thing, but it was hugely rewarding um, because it allowed me to kind of learn a new language and be a bit freer with the way I talked about literature. So that that was those were the the things I I learned and I think they they worked in the episodes that we produced and aired on Maine Public Radio. We've gotten some pretty good feedback. So I don't know if there's anything else I, you want me to say, Lisa, about the the pre production phase. I realized that I didn't introduce myself and none of us did. I was like, we'll introduce ourselves later, yeah. but we never did. So maybe we should just pause, do that, okay. and then we'll get back on track. Cedric, why don't you start introducing yourself? Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Cedric. I am an independent uh, audio engineer and composer. Um, I got into podcasting for, through music. Uh, my background is as a audio engineer for music specifically, and then realized after leaving college that no one's making money doing that so I need to find something else and landed on podcasting um oh my I've been doing it for Ooh, I never thought about uh I think I'm in like the eight to nine year range but I've been a musician all my life um and yeah I handle the sort of I've done like the front end producery things uh and realized I don't like it I don't like being in emails I don't like running around with a microphone but I do love fixing bad recordings making them sound great adding music all that kind of stuff <laughs> so I am I like the post production process is where I is where I sort of uh, landed so yeah and Tess why don't you introduce yourself I'm Tess and I um, teach at Bowdoin College. Um, I write on African American and American 19th century American literature. Thank you. And I'm very new to podcasting. <laughs> but very old to the being passionate about the, the topic matter. Um, 
And my name is Lisa Barfly. I am also an independent um, podcast producer and editor. And I have over the years found myself working more and more in this space that is in between sort of cultural institutions and higher education. And funnily enough, have done several podcast projects that have a relationship to either authors or literature or philosophy in one way or another. So that kind of happened. And I, as Tess mentioned, happened to live in the town of Bowdoin College where uh, Tess is a professor. So that's kind of how, how I got into this particular project. And as I mentioned, I'd been a podcast producer and before that I uh, got my start in public radio in San Francisco and so that's where I really um, honed the craft and the skill of audio storytelling and so maybe differently from some people who come into podcasting for from later years I, I really kind of have this audio journalism background and a slightly different maybe um, understanding of that um, so Yes, Tess, why don't you just tell us about how you came up with the idea? I did. I came up with the idea because uh, I got interested in, in, well, I teach American literature. I work primarily on Harry Peacher Stowe and 19th century African American literature. And Bowdoin College um, had just recently bought the Harriet Beecher Stowe house where she wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin when I got my job here um in the early 2000s and i became interested in the house because their idea for the house was to tear it down um so i uh sort of led this campaign um to to save the house and to figure out uh how to do that and i just started learning more and more about literary houses and um, after I finished that project, and now the Harry Peter Stowe House is here in, Bo at, at, in Brunswick, and it's open to the public, and it um, provides a kind of resource for uh, the community, um, I kind of wanted to keep going because I'd, I'd uh, developed all this knowledge for it, so I was still interested in it. And then around that time, I read I read Brock Clark's novel, An Arsonist's Guide to Literary Homes in New England, which was all about burning them down. And he happened to teach in my department. Um, so we teamed up after a few conversations, um, and you know, it was really students at that time um, in who who were encouraging me to get into podcasts that that was the way of the future and they were right as they are about some things and um uh i i started experimenting with the form and trying to figure out how to how to do this method of storytelling we were just really working with our phones and stuff like that we did have a podcast studio in the basement of of our library but we didn't really know how to use any of the equipment um, so that's when we started to sort of develop um, knowledge and and we reached out to Lisa and um, created episodes and uh, this conversational style between Brock and I as um, uh, as people on the opposite sides of this issue Though we still both of course love reading and love books and um, so we so it was that banter style, uh, which is also the way we kind of teach. Um, that we developed into a series of podcast episodes. All right, we've got a great question from Rebecca. Did, did you wanna answer that now, Tess, or do you wanna wait for the Q&A to talk about, so just for the recording sake, I'm gonna read the, the question loud. So Rebecca Berry asked, Tess, I'd be super curious to hear during Q&A how difficult or easy you and other professors find it to translate classroom voice into podcast voice. Well, I can't speak for other professors. Maybe Lisa could, because um, I know you do work with other other professors. For me, um, it, it I don't know how to sort of measure the level of difficulty. Um, I, maybe it's even a question for for you, Lisa. Like, how much did you have to work with me to do it? We had multiple takes, of course, um, in doing this. And and one of the 
actual difficulties was that we had to realize that reading, reading uh, from a script was very different from the banter that Brock and I had going and also the kind of language to use. Um, so I would say that it is difficult, but it is definitely doable. It just takes time um, to figure out how to do it. Because one of the things about the podcast that I wanted to be really clear about, because this is what I didn't like about other literary, literature podcasts that I listened to is, and academic podcasts for that matter in general, is I didn't want to come off as the expert or the authority, nor did Brock. I wanted it to be like us asking questions and more of learning as we were going. And this is why we have, we're interviewing a lot of different people on the show. So I, I wanted to make it as little about us telling people what we thought about the houses and the, and the books that we were focusing on and more about how best to ask questions. And that was really something we had to learn from our producer, Lisa. So it was difficult, but, but super rewarding. I hope that answers it, Rebecca. I, I think we'll I'll take over as we stay within our time here and then we can loop back to questions uh, for tests uh, towards the end. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the collaboration and labor sharing best practices during the production phase. And by that, I mean, you know, once we started really recording, um, scripting and doing first rounds of editing. And uh, there's a lot what I can say about that, and I've kind of focused in on um, one accessing campus resources for your podcast and um, collaborating with com campus staff. And secondly, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about collaborating with main public radio, which could be a stand in, I think, for any public radio station in your area. And uh, lastly, managing schedules, which I saved for last because I felt like I failed that. So <laughs> here we go. So when it came to accessing campus resources and collaborating with campus staff, uh, that ended up being wonderful in the sense that Tess and Brock, who are co-hosts of this, have the good fortune of working for a very well-funded uh, private college that already had things in place like a podcast studio and recording equipment uh, that students and faculty and staff can borrow for free. Although it seemed like the campus resources were mainly for people who had campus affiliation, which I do not directly have. Uh, being hired by Tess and Brock to facilitate this project still didn't mean that I had a direct access to these things. So what seemed like an obvious resource, they were sitting right there, often un or underutilized, uh, was actually a little more challenging to get my hands on than it first appeared, because I would have to go to tests, to kind of book studios and check out equipment and so what seemed like an easy thing uh, ended up being a little wonkier in the end and also because I was kind of like a non-affiliated person getting support from staff who manned and were responsible for that equipment was sometimes a little challenging it wasn't quite clear uh, who they were working for or who I was working for and I think um, a lot of issues could have been smoothed out there in our collaboration what ended up being really wonderful was that we ended up using other campuses uh, resources quite a bit. So whenever we had a remote recording with a guest who was affiliated with the University or College, I reached out to my counterpart at their college and asked, hey, can our guest use your studio and can you help them set it up? Could you do the local recording for us? And more often than not, they were very game to do it. They were excited to see that the studios were used. Uh, they were happy to help out and it became a wonderful way of having more stakeholders and partners in other institutions for this project. Since it came out, I've been in touch with all of those folks who worked in the libraries and, and media studios of these colleges and they've kind of 
been cheering us along and tuning in. And so that was just also a wonderful way to, to grow our audience and grow our support base because those people also ended up listening or at least, you know, knowing about it. Um, and so that was actually a campus resource that hadn't come to mind to me from the get go was not our resources, but our guests resources. Um, and so when it comes to collaborating with the college, I feel like the best practices for me um, would have been to involve the campus staff more, both ours and others. And I think that just based on the interactions that I had with campus staff in other uh, institutions, they were happiest when they were actually directly asked to do something, not just to like provide it for me to do something. I think they would have really welcomed the opportunity to get their hands on on the equipment and feel like they were really a part of it. So that was the note to myself here was to just involve campus staff more rather than think that I was going to like don't want to take up your time. This is the kind of project that I think is exciting for them to do rather than just help students change batteries and recorders. So um, that would be my my encouragement is to meet with them ahead of time and to ask how you know how and in what capacity could you be involved and would you like to be um, because there's so many talented uh, people working at colleges and they often want to have more creative outlets than perhaps their positions would allow them for. Secondly, we collaborated with Maine Public Radio. As Tess mentioned, we had the awesome opportunity to be uh, using them as our distribution partner, which is something that I've never done before, had this uh, collaboration between a podcast, which is you know ruled by a very different financing structure, funding structure, but also distribution methods, and then the public radio that is regulated through the FCC and just functions in a different way. Everything from uh, how it's made to how it's paid for and who listens. And to be able to live in these both worlds, we can both publish it as a podcast and have it air on public radio, was just fantastic. It was such an honor. The main public allowed us to put this in front of their listeners on their air airwaves, uh, but it also had some challenges, uh, especially when it came to the funding. As I mentioned, the FCC uh, regulates how public radio can kind of deal with ad private advertising. We couldn't just be like, go eat Joe's Burgers, they're the best. Uh, you know, I think we've all heard the better help and rocket mortgage loans and I don't know, me undies were back in the day, like that wasn't really an option for us. We had to cast for mattresses, yes. We had to figure out other ways of fundraising and thinking about what in public radio is called underwriting our sponsorship. Um, or we could figure out these hybrid methods where one thing would be set on air, but then we could sell ads uh, on our podcasting feed. And that was just technically and sort of logistically a little complicated. Uh, but it was so worth it to us to have the trust that listeners have given to main public be reflected back on us. The fact that we had the seal of approval from main public that they thought this was good enough to distribute on their channels made it easier for us to get sponsors. We could say, hey, you know, we know X number of people tune into main public. Uh, they will have the opportunity to hear it. And so having public radio's endorsement really made funding easier with individual and corporate sponsors in that way, which I think probably made up for the lack of possibilities of getting yeah casper which we certainly don't have enough listeners to get casper anyway um another aspect of collaborating with main public radio was that they already have an enormous amount of infrastructure and in-house talent that they were very generous to lend to us so for example they built us a landing page on the main public website and we didn't have to get our own website, which would have, uh, you know, involved building the website, maintaining the website, paying for the website. They took that on and uh, that also gave our 
podcast a place to live on the internet because the internet and tech still reign supreme. It's really important to have a place that, you know, when you type in your search ending dead writers, you get to a text place, uh, which main public provides that like website with text and such. Um, so they did that and they could also help us a lot with the marketing uh, because they already have like a large following on social media and they have, you know, a person whose only job it is to do social marketing media, which as a small little scrappy upstarts team, we don't have someone who does that. They were super helpful with um, collaborating with us on promoting us on social media, uh, bumping our posts, liking our posts, co-sharing uh, some of our posts and things like that. And we could really piggyback on a lot of the people that they had already kind of built up as their audience. Um, so when it comes to like some of the best practices that I've boiled down for us working with public radio, it was really um, to use their resources and infrastructure as much as you can. Most public radio stations are chronically underfunded. They will not give you money, <laughs> which has been the case with our relationship with pub main public radio as well. They have not given us any support for the production, but they will give you part of their time and knowledge if you just ask for it. And so that has been wonderful. But remember that if you really want to grow your podcast, that's going to be on you. Like, Radios are and radio stations aren't really set up for the kind of podcast marketing and distribution that you might need and want to get the reach that you're looking for. So remember that you're ultimately responsible for the marketing, funding, and production of your podcast. And then another best practices that I kind of a takeaway for me was that it was really important for us to retain both editorial control um but also the control of hosting and owning the material because that meant that we could both monetize the podcast outside of the constraints and regulations of public radio but also that we just own our material we felt like 10 years down the road you know what We're, we don't want this on public radio anymore or we want to update this with these new voices that would be ours to do so those were the two takeaways it's like don't expect them to share any money because they don't have enough to go around to begin with, but do see if they can help you with it, pretty much everything else. Um, and then make sure that you retain um, control over the editorial process and your intellectual property. And lastly, since I am case in point, not managing time, managing time was hard. Over to you, Cedric. <laughs> My goodness. I don't know why I can never find the microphone button in Zoom. I don't know. Never. Wait, you're just it's in the same spot. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> well, all right. Um, so I'm going to talk about the post production, uh, and that for me started with composing the theme. Um, my process for writing theme. So, writing themes is pretty much the same across, no matter who the client is for me, whether it's an indie pr uh, production like this or um, I don't know, bigger named clients with more money, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I actually pretty much refined the process a lot with them because I've realized that talking about music can be really difficult. It can also still be difficult, like talking from musician to musician. Um, so even more so when you're not talking to other musicians. Uh, so my process for this is asking the team or the person that I'm working with to create a playlist and to like take a beat to actually make it and think about it because <laughs> I had one situation where someone like sent over something in 10 minutes and then the rest of the composing process was a mess. So take a beat, really think about your reference references um, and describe in like a sentence or two why that is in the playlist. And for me, that sort of creates I use the word dictionary, like a shared language between me and someone and like producers, folks who aren't not musical to like say, to give us some sh shared language uh, as to what they're looking for. So maybe someone will give me a track and they say, I really like the energy in this one. 
I can then listen to it and say, oh, okay, the drums are doing this, the keys are doing this thing. That is what energy equals for them. And how can I extract um, those parts into the composition that I'm going to make? And so like we have like the sort of, uh, you know, shared language. And then I also like, once I like give the, the first um, draft to over, I'm also like, I, this is what I took from the references and this is why this is there. Um, so for our show, let's see, we had a lot of like contemporary American indie rock. Um, so some things on the reference list was The Wild Kindness by Silver Jews. We had Cemetery Gates by the Smith, Smiths, <laughs> more than one Smith, uh, and Let's Go by Blondie uh, and a few others. But there was one tune that stood out Texas Tornado by Doug Sam and the Tex-Mex band. And I think it stood out for me because it was sort of older Americana, rocky, rock and roll, bluesy kind of tune. So, you know, I sit down, I listen to the references. Uh, usually for like, a, I don't know. I don't remember how long I took, but I like to take about a week or two. The more time, the better. So like let them marinate, listen to the playlist as I'm like going on a walk, cooking dinner, taking a break just to like soak it all in um so the first draft of the theme the what I sort of had in mind was like what if Doug Sam and the Tex-Mex band interpreted some of the more contemporary songs on uh on the playlist and we can listen to that first draft right now mind you this is a first draft it was rough and I'm not a good guitar player at all So that was draft one. Um, and when I sent it over, it basically said, this is how I'm interpreting the theme. Um, and oh, and to say I sent it just to Lisa. Uh, Lisa was my point of contact and that stayed the case throughout the entire thing, which is great. I have done, I've also learned that like sending it sometimes to a team can be difficult because then I'll get a team's separate thoughts um and sometimes they like contradict each other and so then I have to like kind of pick and choose so I've learned that you know my preferred method is to just have like one person to sort of filter through everything make sure that all the feedback is cohesive and that like nothing does contradict each other and then it gets sent back to me um and that feedback for this was I'm gonna read some of the emails um very catchy like when the guitar comes in we like the ambiance and then uh, wanting to hear a version that was a little less suspenseful. Uh, this was, I like, this was a funny one. I'm concerned that the name Dead Riders combined with the music will lead listeners to think that this is a true crime pod and then be terribly disappointed. <laughs> so I wanted to try something a little bit more road trippy, more wistful. So I got a new um, reference to work off. It was Everybody's Talking from Harry Nilsson. Um, and so... I then was like, okay, let's listen to this new thing. Let's incorporate those new, you know, I already had like the sort of like, okay, road trip, be wistful. That was like the dictionary that I can then, you know, take the musical elements from. Um, so, you know, I kept everything that we liked, mostly changed just the arrangement and the sound and like kept the chord progression. So that way, you know, in the, in the revision process, it could be let's, you know, mash the two together. Or like, we like this from this one thing or from the first version, we like this from the second thing. And, the th and it can still be uh, pretty cohesive. So I'm going to play the actual version.
so yeah we'll chug it along more americana but still you know same sort of uh vibe cowboys <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that's what we're going for <laughs> um and so like that i gotta say this was a, a very painless uh music <laughs> experience um i've definitely had like some you know, rounds of versions we go back like four, five or six times. And so like, that's not fun. Um, but uh, once the second version was made, everyone was happy and it worked. So it was great. Um, so now I'm gonna move over to the sound design. Um, this show actually, oh, there you go. Yeah, um, you're welcome. <laughs> this was uh, actually my second road trip podcast. My first one was Driving the Green Book where they sort of did a, something similar where they were driving to green book locations. Um, and so that was, uh, I guess, a formative project for me as a sound designer, because that was like one of the first ones where I was doing this sort of like mix of like studio things, field things. How do we sort of like marry the two together and it makes sense. Um, so for me, what I learned from that was sort of like the honoring the space that uh, we're sort of occupying or like, not, maybe occupying is not a good, I, honoring the space that we are in, recording in, walking around. Um, so, you know, the studio recordings are very clean, but like the field recordings, I might not clean them up as much. You know, uh, I might sort of try to replicate the feeling of everyone being in the room by not having each speaker be like dead center. Maybe like someone in what's called the stereo field left to right might be a little bit off. So you could sort of like get the feeling like you're in the room, in the space with them as they're moving around into, yeah, as they're moving around in it. Um, so, you know, any stylistic choices in the mixing was kind of made from there. And, you know, for me coming in as an engineer, I sort of, uh, how I approach it is like making those decisions. I'll talk about those decisions when it comes to a first mix. Um, and then just sort of going from there, like maybe, like, I think there might've been like a little back and forth, like, oh, like this could be cleaned up a little bit more just so like, it's a little bit clearer, like, what this person who's off in the corner is saying or something like that. Um, and so like that also bleeds into the musical choices that we did with the library, like the show itself. Um, so I tried to make it, I, I want, what I wanted to do was to have music that sort of evoke the same, like, you know, um, not a uh, same feeling of like, being in a space and walking around in it. So like none of the cues have like more energy than the first one. I kind of felt like the first one was like putting the key into the ignition to drive to the house. And then once you're like there, everything's sort of like chill and calm and like thoughtful, you know, you're kind of just, you know, floating along. Um, and, you know, uh, having like experience, I mean, the, it's very, I don't want to say rare, but not every day do you get to work with original music. So I have a lot of experience working on podcasts that had to use library music. So I know a lot of them really well. We ended up using Blue Dot Sessions, which sort of has a lot of uh, music that fits in the same genre of what the theme was, um, but also had like a wide licensing agreement that we could both use in the podcast space and in the radio space without like worrying about finding, you know, separate licenses and things like that. Um, so, oh, and then I'm just going to finish off with the feedback, which again was a pretty painless process. Everything was again filtered through Lisa. Um, and I didn't have to like go through a bunch of notes of like, who wants this thing? This like, th th this thing doesn't work with that thing. Which one should I go with? That didn't happen a lot. Um, I think the, the most difficult part for during this, during the process was just like getting things to time because public radio, you have to have a very specific window was like 29 minutes and I think you could like <laughs> you had like a little bit of wiggle room to be under but you couldn't go over um and so typically in radio you know everything is produced to a clock like you have 10 minutes for the a interview the minute commercial break 15 minutes for the b interview whatever shows over um but since this was produced like a podcast where the and especially the this form of podcast it was very elastic so like you know maybe some episodes have more in studio stuff, or maybe some, and others have more in the field, in the house recordings. And, you know, there's a few episodes where, you know, there's a lot of archival. There's a few episodes where we had 
folks act like reading some of the um work so like you know things kind of shifted and moved and formed so you know when i would finish it'd be like oh great uh we need like a minute more material <laughs> or oh we're like two minutes over and like here are some and like i would never like step in editorial be like you know this is what i think you should cut i would just say this section is this long maybe you know if you want to that, that's a but that's a, you know that's not that's not up to me <laughs> i just you know gave it on a very technical level um so yeah and then you know working but other than that working the, with the radio on the technical end was fine uh they did not have a very strenuous um technical needs um they just needed a specifically a high fidelity wave file um, that was in stereo 44.1, blah, 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 audio jargon. <laughs> um, but like, you know, a podcast just needs an MP3, um, which is fine. Most, uh, it's called digital audio workstations, allow you to uh, export files at the same time, different types of files at the same time. So it would just be like, when it's done, here's what the radio needs. Here's what the podcast needs. And it's the same thing. We don't have to worry about it. Um, and yeah, I think that's it for me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Cedric. So um, if anyone wants to ask questions, um, feel, please do. Okay, I'm gonna read Andrew's questions aloud again for the recording for folks who are uh, listening to this after the fact. Andrew asks, um, how did your partnership with Maine Public Radio come about? Can you say more about how it affected your podcast format, the timing of each episode and production schedule. Have you found that radio professionals view podcasts as inferior to our inferior competitors? Um, and then I'm gonna, uh, there's the second part of that question that we're gonna have a specific answer. But the first one, uh, do you wanna talk a little bit more to us about how the partnership with Maine Public com came about? Um. I mean, I, I, I did say about how I had um, been asked to be an ex expert on one of their shows. And then they, when thanking me, they just basically said, you were great on the show, would like love to have you back. Like one of those main public radio call-in shows. And I said, well, actually, I have this idea for a podcast I'd love to run by you. And then um, the producer said, oh, okay, tell me about it. And I told her about it. And she said, okay, the person to talk to is the... Um, program director. So she put me in touch with her. And then we scheduled a meeting with her, Lisa and I did. And we talked, told her all about the podcast. And she said, Oh, sounds really interesting. But I really can't make a judgment until you get me a pilot episode, which of course, we did not have. And that was the impetus to really get moving and get moving fast. And so we produced a pilot without any music. This was before Cedric came in the picture. It was re really just Lisa, Brock, and me who created a pilot. We sent her the pilot. She loved it. And she said, okay, make episodes. Uh, how many ever you want. Uh, they should be this long. We'll air them on Sunday nights right after the Moth uh, story hour. And she gave us very little uh, direction or parameters other than that. And she said, you have complete creative control. So our relationship sort of developed in that fashion. And uh, then when we submitted all the episodes to her, she listened to them and we were kind of on, what would you say, Lisa? We were kind of um, on tenter hooks or whatever, you know, trying to like hope that she would take it, even though we did have a contract with her. Um, they were they still could refuse to air it if they didn't think the quality was high enough. So that's that, that was that was how it developed, Lisa. Yes, exactly. And so uh, in when it comes to the podcast format, uh, we had developed our format ahead of time and making the pilot um, was very helpful in solidifying what we thought worked and what we didn't. And one of the really important parts of the format for us was the tone. It's really important that we were going to talk about great American writers like Hawthorne, Stowe, Longfellow, old 19th century writers in a way that felt fresh, funny, accessible. And so having that in mind already was like, okay, we can't have two academics in a room going la 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 la. So already like just knowing what the tone was kind of led us to the format. And then one thing we had done uh, 
before the pandemic, like a few years back, we had applied for one of the NEH grants that Peter Fritz said, um, presented on this morning. And that process was also very helpful in kind of solidifying what the format was going to be. So that was already in place when we approached main public. That was what allowed us to make the pilot fairly quickly. Uh, the timing of each episode and production schedule. Yeah, so she said we could have a, a weekly slot. She didn't limit how many episodes we would have, but we all agreed that summer months would be best since this was kind of a road trip format. And a lot of the writers' homes that we center in each episode, we go to a different writers' home in Maine for each episode, they're only open in the summer. And during tourist season. So it made sense that like this is going to air when people are driving around Maine on their vacations and being like, yeah, let's swing by, you know, this house. Let's swing by, you know, Edwin Arlington Robinson's house and check it out. I just heard that great show. So um, we knew that it was weekly. We knew that we had a 30 minute uh, slot and we knew with the kind of narrative complex storytelling we were doing there's no way you can do that running with the kind of production team we had and with the otherwise busy schedules of full-time academics and audio engineers so we needed to have it all in the can before we started airing we needed to have the whole season completed and when it came to the production schedule it was really hugely uh, dependent on the fact that we had these other full-time uh, professional commitments so we did all of our reporting in the field during spring break, which in hindsight, I wish we hadn't um, because we wanted so many of the sort of like rocks pop, so many people on the street, people engaging with us um, that weren't necessarily academics. Going around in freezing cold March, Maine is was not the way to do it. Um, but that's when we had time to do all the field recordings and then we had time to kind of putter away at the scripting and the in-studio recordings kind of throughout the spring and then we invited Cedric to come along and, and start working with the more finished finalized product um, later in May and then he kind of worked on that May June and, and we got it to them mid June and they started airing um, in July. And let's see here. Have you found that Radio Professional View podcasts as inferior or competitors? Um, I think that varies from station to station. What the relationship between public radio, in particular, and podcasts are? I'm gonna I'm gonna be as diplomatic as saying that. I think it varies hugely. I think a lot of radio professionals know that the distinction is more formality than not. Um, so, no, no, not really. I, I would approach them for sure. And now for Cedric's part of the question from Andrew, for yes. music that are not original compositions and other audio clips, such as archival news, how do you handle rights? Uh, uh, differently, depending on the situation. Uh, for music like show music that we're using you know to like transition between scenes and like that uh i def you know you definitely want to make sure that you have um a licensing set up so that way you can have you know use of the music without any issues so that's why we went with blue dot it's very simple you have a subscription service um for you know as long as this show is being um published but you know usually you'll get it a little bit before so that way you can download your tracks and have them in and all that um and different there's like a whole bunch of different like licensing houses that will do that sort of thing for you um and for this show specifically though we wanted to just make sure that it both worked for podcasts and terrestrial radio which was, this one did most of them do but you definitely just want to make sure when you're looking at the terms and services uh or whatever you know the licensing agreement that they'll give you um that you know you're covered depending on the specific medium um other audio clips news is usually you, you news i always feel like falls under fair use to be honest um and so i think we use like some things from like about the, an author or two like when it first was uh you know when they, when they were uh, as a primary source i guess oh i haven't used that 
department. Well, I'm not an academic, so it's been a minute. <laughs> I mean, I think that what was helpful was that a lot of the authors were uh, 19th century authors. So a lot of their material had already fallen into or like out of copywriting so that we right. could uh, read their works on air so that listeners could hear the writing firsthand and not have to worry about any kind of copywriting uh, or um, licensing issues with the literature. In a couple of instances, uh, there was still active copyright laws in estates, and we got went ahead and contacted the estates directly and got their permission. And they gave us permission. Um, I think a lot of people are just very happy for these writers to be heard and talked about, and knowing that they are being brought back into the open. So that would be. Um, and us and Vincent Malay's estate give us permission for two uh, poems to be uh, used. And those are Ines and Vincent Malay reading her poems herself. We get to hear her voice. It's really powerful. And we also get to hear James Walden Johnson read his own poetry, um, another very powerful piece of audio. So, mm -hmm. so that's also part of it. And then we are um, a nonprofit and affiliated with an educational institution. So any kind of fair use case, I feel like we have that going for us. We're not like making money off of people um, and it's clearly educational, so. Oh, and one other thing I will say, um, there was like one situation we just avoided it all together. So like for James Weldon Johnson's episode yeah. where we wanted to uh, play Lift Every Voice and Sing that he wrote, we could not find a recording from around the time it was written that was in that would be in fair use um i think the the, the cutoff was like maybe a couple years so like if we yeah. <laughs> um so then we said okay so we can't find a recording that works so i just like i played it <laughs> and we like made a scene of like a beep of uh, sound design, so, uh, a saxophonist is this my main instrument playing it in like a stadium and so you get the same evokes the same feeling but you know we don't have the copyright issue anymore so yeah. because like the music the written music is is why can't I, it's not in fair, fair use, fair use but in the do common domain. domain thank you public domain oh my goodness is it <laughs> a public, public domain, domain but any yeah. recordings were not so yeah. that's how we like avoided that situation so that was yeah. a fun challenge to to figure out yeah that was that was a little that was a little tricky actually i remember recall that yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right we got a couple more questions so rebecca Oh, uh, let's do, hold on, I'm missing questions here. Uh, Brooke, curious about the concept. Considering the podcast is also about homes and decor, how did you handle the lack of visual aid? And how did you create the visual through audio only? Who wants to take that one? Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I guess I should. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it was, it was, but it was done a lot with the help of Lisa coaching Brock and I to remember that exactly as you say, Brooke, that this is an audio show. So she was constantly reminding us by asking each other, like, how does that feel? What does that, what does that look like? And so we were sort of doing that as we were talking to each other. I think that was, the biggest way when we would go to the houses but then there was also the people who we were interviewing at the houses who would show us things and then we would ask questions like what am i looking at here and then they would have to answer and so we we were very conscious of that aspect of the show to make sure we were giving listeners a sense of of where we are we said yeah. do you want to add anything yeah and so a lot of when we felt like we weren't helping we weren't the eyes of the listener in um in the field we could add that in the scripting that led us into the studio so for example um the very first episode the harry beecher stowe episode it kind of starts with like this description of what the house looks like from the outside because the house is like barren inside so there's nothing much to kind of drive off of inside or um so 
there's like it's a white house on federal street with a lot of crooked windows and green shutters or whatever there's like this description so so really being conscious of being uh the eyes and ears of the listeners as you're walking through things is generally the way to go and then cedric uh added on to that with the music that added so much atmosphere which helps you strangely to see i'm sorry i'm using very ableist language here but but um that's a, best as I can do. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Uh, okay, so T, if it's not, isn't too much as independence, how do you pay each other, at least on Cedric? Is it from grants, like you mentioned, NEH, et cetera? Tess, actually funding is your strong. So I did all the fundraising myself because we didn't get that NEH that we applied for, <clears throat> though we hope to reapply. But for this, because we were in such a rush, um, to do it because we had this green light from Maine Public, I relied on um, sponsors uh, and I used Bowdoin College as our 501c3. And um, they gave us an account and we worked with their team who works on getting corporate sponsors. And then so in terms of paying Lisa and Cedric, that, that was the money that I basically raised from both like back savings, local, local sponsors, but mostly it was private donors, um, alums, students that Brock and I had taught uh, who had gone on to make lots of money and were willing to give back to the institution. I had to get the green light from Bowdoin's development team to allow us to contact those donors and to use that money. So it was a, it was a pretty tricky business. So I worked with both the development office at Bowdoin and also with their corporate sponsorships. Um, so it was cobbling together that, and then um, private contractors would be paid out of that fund directly from Bowdoin. And when it came to setting our rates for Cedric and me, I we were somewhat leaning on uh, the A uh, Air uh, Rate Guide, so the Associations of Independent and Media and Radio. Although um, I think we both this wasn't our most lucrative job. <laughs> If I'm speaking for myself, at least, I'm assuming it wasn't your most lucrative gig, Cedric, but um, it was really a, a pleasure and a joy to be working on it. And it, it, we were able to be, or I felt fairly compensated. Yeah. And I mean, I, for me, uh, you know, maybe most freelancers, maybe a lot, a lot of freelancers don't think about this either, but like I sort of am like, okay, like, is this about what I would get paid? And then like also what, a specific like client is going to pay are they going to get the same are they get are they getting an, an equal or an appropriate amount of value out of it so like if spotify approached me for something they are going to get more value out of my work than you know this group so like i'm not that's just like a personal thing but you know i'm i'm not going to like look at the conversation the same way mm -hmm. so i like to work <laughs> Yeah. I like to yeah. pay rent. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's 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 tough out there. Well, I don't yeah. like paying rent, but you know. <laughs> yeah. Um question for Lisa and Tess. I've been asked by my review team to give one of the faculty hosts on my podcast some critical feedback, such as try not to sound like you're reading off a piece of paper and try not to sound so monotone on lines like, wow, that's incredible. Any tips? on how to share such feedback with sensitivity, but also how to take effect. I think I'm gonna answer that, Tess. Okay, um, <clears throat> tracking, which is a, a name that we use for recording some of the scripted narration in a studio is its own art form. It truly is. And I think that, um, what's going to work for one person differs from what's going to work for another person in terms of ease and control one thing that made working with tess and rock so fantastic for me and helped me coach them out of that mode sometimes successfully sometimes less so but was that they are good students they listen to the podcast that i sent them 
and took notes, listened critically, what works, what doesn't work. And B, they're great, fantastic writers. And well, lastly, thirdly, they're also fantastic teachers. They do like to talk to people. And I think that um, it can be very difficult if you have been trained to speak in a certain voice with a certain authority to switch that up. I think sometimes it helps to imagine that you're speaking to a friend, maybe bring in a friend photo of that friend. Maybe it's your teenage kids or college age kids. Um, that can help people remember that it's a conversation even though the other party isn't there. Um, I would also encourage standing up rather than sitting down, taking deep breaths, having a loose body and a loose mind. Um, you know, I, there was one time I, this is just, we're just adults in this room. One time I brought in a teeny bit of bourbon for Tess and Rock. It was during like finals, they were grading papers, so they were in a lot of stress, they were really tired. This was a redo of an interview they've already done that failed for technical reasons. They were not happy. And so I did what I had to do to kind of get them like in a little bit of a festive mood, a little bit more relaxed. This was, mind you, like a thimble of, of bourbon each, but it was just set the tone of like, I'm gonna relax. Okay, we're having a conversation. I don't need to perform and I don't need to lecture. So I don't know, trying a variety of different ways, but really I think encouraging them to listen to other podcasts and having a conversation with them. Oh, what did you like about that podcast? Oh, and then maybe you can talk about how other podcast hosts have successfully managed the narration part in a way that's a little more casual. I hope that's helpful, Rebecca, you're in a tough spot. All right. Um, are there questions we've missed? Anyone? Um, T, did you feel like we got uh, retained control over intellectual property? Um, the, the easiest way of retaining control in this sense was that A, they have not paid for it. So there's no sort of, they have no claim in it. They function solely as a distribution channel. And B, what we did is that we have our own um, RSS feed and podcast hosting platform that we hosted ours. We gave them the RSS feed. So we're sort of sitting on all the stems, all the sort of original material is in our control, as is the feed that goes out to the podcast platform. So uh, we can pull it at any time. And then. Well, oh. about this, if there's anybody else with questions, maybe you can raise your hand and then Lisa will call on you. Did you just spot one more in the chat, Lisa? No, I was just feeling for tea and the living writers hmm. difficulty. Yeah. I had a quick one for Cedric. Cedric, when I have worked with music, which is usually archival or um, something from a database, mm -hmm. I find that I initially start with maybe an eight to 12 second clip, and then I make it shorter and shorter and shorter until you first hear a person speaking. Would mm -hmm. you say to lean into that impulse or to let the music kind of mull over the audience. I find that I I think I just have a low expectation for people's attention spans and patience. What have you found about the amount of time that music can play before people are like, okay, let's get to the podcast? Uh, it it usually is on the shorter side. Um, I like to push a little bit sometimes and there's definitely and you know I you know as the the sound designer I don't get the final say the producer does so like you know I might advocate for like a little bit more you know or a little bit less um are you are you specifically talking about like the introduction to the podcast or like yes. in transition okay um I don't know I that's a I don't, I think for an introduction, I don't mind something a little bit longer just to kind of, you know, get into the feeling of the show, um, sort of like get the listener 
energy right you know like it's like i worked on like a worked on a couple like gaming podcasts and like for those those are like high energy a lot of laughs and you know they're talking about a fun subject so like i want the music to like kick in and like everyone sort of get in the right mood um but like you know for like maybe a show and i've actually i've also done this too for like shows where like a, a more serious topic is being discussed we'll like you know use less or use a lower amount of music you know less time also just like not as much stuff in it um so I, you know i it, it, it's a little bit show dependent but i think for an intro you can have a little fun with it the only time you get to do it why not <laughs> May I I just add something? I had a, I produced a show once where they had a original piece that was a a symphonic piece. It was a new music, um, beautiful piece. Um, But it had a lot of times, a lot of times and bells in the beginning. And it was especially, you know, original music and it was important to to the creator to have that. But it was terribly confusing. Like it was really confusing. It was like, what is this? Is is the church bells are ringing, or well, what's happening? And the way that we managed to keep it intact, well, not intact, to keep it playing for the duration without getting people to turn off because they were confused, was that we let it play for a few seconds, then just said the name of the podcast, and then let it finish before we got into the tagline and introduction. So there was like this little lull in the, in the music, it came in like, and then it was like quiet. And then it, she said like, on our and between worlds and, then, and I went, kept going for like a good 30 seconds or so. And then you're like, this is a mm. podcast about blah, blah, blah. And that was the way in which we just flagged to people like, oh no, you're in the right place, please stay. Um, so, but still kind of kept the whole piece. Yes, uh, Brad. Yeah, hey, I'm I'm wondering how you guys imagine distribution up after a kind of a local, you know, because Maine is it's a big it's a big market in some ways, it's a small market too, but it's a big market, and I'm sure you get a nice kick up from you know public radio and people listening to the broadcast. In terms of the podcast itself, I'm sure you're on a bunch of RSS feeds, but with all the limited time you guys have, I, we found with ours, it's so hard to spend that time on the real marketing and getting it out there. Have you guys, how have you cracked that code a little bit to, to kind of get, get your uh, piece in front of folks as a kind of podcast out there in the world? You tell me, Whew, that was yeah, the hardest one to crack, I think, or it has been for our team because we come with experience of the creating uh, from Tess, who has such a rich knowledge of the material and such a clear artistic vision of the format, to Cedric, who's an amazing professional at what he does and knows how to perfect that. We are not marketing and distribution specialists and, and, yeah. and competing with so many other podcasts in that space. And getting it at you saying in front of people is uh, is hard. It's much easier when you have the like, captive audience of terrestrial radio. Um, I, I don't know that we have cracked it. What have we done? No, that's why we're at this conference. We're going to like, help yeah. us, please. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I, I just was asking because the problem is time, really. You know, yeah. it's it's you guys are making it. I know how much time it takes to make it. And then then you do it, you know, you get it out there and you promote it locally, I'm sure very well. And they help promote you. And then you also are, it's out there among many podcast platforms. But, you know, the extra time that it takes to really do that extra work is, a, is, a, is a, it's pretty time con- intensive. So I, I don't know if, if you figure it out, tell me. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, we've had some, some, some wonderful, there's been some wonderful sessions here. That's left me with a lot of different thoughts around, should we start a newsletter? Should we? Uh, but yeah, all these, it's sort of weighing uh, time with the what we hope to achieve uh, by doing these things. You know, Tess, do you have any ideas on the distribution? No, uh, as you said, it, it is the, the tough nut to crack. We've decided to kind of stick with public radio. Um, as we proceed, I don't know if if 
there are more costs and benefits to that right now. I think that's how we're trying to get word of our podcast out. We'll approach other when our season two is moving out of Maine into Massachusetts, Connecticut, um, New Hampshire, um, maybe upstate New York. Um, and then we'll contact those local public radio stations in those states. Uh, we have this connection with Maine Public, so we're hoping that we'll be able to grow our audience that way as it has a little bit more of a national reach. Um, we hope to draw in listeners that way, but I think right now what we need to do is produce more episodes. So most of our energy, our time is going into making making the show. And um, we only have seven episodes, right, Lisa? And that's not, I don't think that's enough. I think we need at least 25 and, and make, it, make it something that people can really sink their teeth into. And um, the other thing that we've been really um, trying is to get more engagement, like trying to involve our existing audience and the production, you know, like have contests about where they want us to go. We've had a lot of unsolicited feedback, like, oh, you, you should go this to this place and this place and this place. And we've had a lot of, like for, for a small operation like us, we've had quite a bit of media attention um, because they, from, from the main office of tourism, from the Portland Press Herald, very much outside of our academic network. And so that, that's been pretty good in growing our audience, but I think we need to do more, more episodes. I think that's really the only thing, that, the only solution I have at this point. Thanks for the question. And thanks, thanks for being here. Thank you. That's great. Well, if there are no more questions, maybe we will call this a day for this particular panel. Thank you so much. I think this was a really phenomenal experience of having some practical audio, of having three very different perspectives on the process. I think a lot of people took away a lot from this. So we really appreciate you being here. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. Thank you for having us.